Father, what an incredible promise that because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins, that we can be dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We can stand before that throne faultless. Not that we are sinless, but because of that precious blood that was shed, we have been made blameless in you. So, Father, may we never get over that. May we always sing and praise you for the work that you have done through Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, I just pray that our hearts are truly prepared to hear your word, that we would respond in your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we want to talk about the kingdom of God and how that changes how you and I think, how we act as kingdom citizens, what does it mean? Now, in just two short days, or if you have uh, TV or social media, two long days, our nation will again go to the polls and we will complete the process of electing officials to lead. Have you ever noticed that, especially over these last several election cycles, you keep hearing this one phrase, this is the most important election of our lifetime. You keep hearing that, right? By the way, it's nothing new. It actually started back in the 60s with JFK. And it's been every election since. This is the most important. Now, I want to be very clear at the outset here. My job as a pastor is not to tell you who to vote for. But rather to remind all of us of some important biblical truths. And while we look at these things from a biblical perspective, trusting that God will inform how we interact with this process. Uh, but to this end, if you have not read it or you have not heard me talk about it, uh, there's a book. You can get it on Google Books or Amazon uh, Kindle. It's called Before You Vote. It's by David Platt. Um, it's a pretty short read, and I highly recommend it. It is an incredible book to, to go through there. But this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus' most political statement. In three and a half years, he made one political statement, so to speak. And it comes in the form of a trap from the religious leaders. The, the religious leaders wanted to trap Jesus because if Jesus said, don't pay your taxes, then they could accuse him of trying to lead a revolt against the Roman government. But if he said, no, you better pay your taxes, then they would accuse him of not being solely devoted to God. So the trap is set, so to speak, and so what Jesus does is incredibly telling. And I would say it's really important for you and I as kingdom citizens living in this fallen world. Here's the one big thing for the morning. Our love and our loyalty belong to Jesus only. What does that mean? What does that look like? And, and by the way, before we get too far in uh, to it, if you want to take some notes and you have the Bible app, you can go there. And you'll be able to see it. Just search for Westlake Baptist Church up under events. And it'll be there. If you're watching on Facebook Live, there's a link directly to them as well. But let's go ahead and dive into our scripture this morning. Mark chapter 12. If you would stand as we honor the reading of God's word. And we begin in verse 13. It says, And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give, or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at it. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it gives us the truth. 
And in a moment such as this, in this time and place in our nation, Father, I pray that your children will live as kingdom citizens, as the church. Father, help us to understand what that means in a political process that is full of partisanship and politicking. Father, help us to maintain our testimony and our witness for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our love and our loyalty belong to Jesus only. So we're going to talk about elections, life, and kingdom citizens. Because this isn't just about Tuesday. This is about Wednesday morning. So Jesus here, in his most political statement, he's, he begins by saying, Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. So Jesus says, as they're trying to lay this trap, Jesus says, bring me a coin. Now, in the King James, it says a penny. Some of your translations may say a denarius. It was a day's wage. Somebody who worked all day, this is what they got paid. And Jesus says, tell me, whose image is on this coin? He goes, it's Caesar's. Well, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. So... What exactly does render to Caesar that which is Caesar's mean? How are you and I as Christians to live in this temporary kingdom in light of we are eternal kingdom citizens? Well, the first one is this, that we are to submit to our government as Paul says in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Okay, we are to submit to our government. Paul actually says this in that text, that if you resist the government, you are in fact resisting God who ordained that government. Regardless of how we feel about our elected officials, because God is sovereign, he has put them in place for a purpose. Now, here's the caveat. If the government asks us to violate biblical standards, then we rightfully refuse. Why? Because our love and our loyalty are Jesus's and no one else's. So we, we see that we have this right in the duty. If you were to go to Daniel 2 and chap, chapter 2 and chapter 3, you, you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? You see them resisting the government instead of uh, submitting to them because what they were asking for is their love and loyalty. And they say, no, that belongs to God and God alone. So we are to submit to our government. If you were to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you would see that we are to render to Caesar prayers for them. There is no greater gift that you can give anyone than the gift of praying for them. And this is especially true for our elected officials. Listen, whether or not we want to admit this, they have a very difficult job. Okay? They have to try to make hundreds of millions of people somewhat happy. Good luck. Like if you have a fight in your family on just deciding where you're going to eat after Sunday service, imagine trying to decide how you are going to spend the, the money of in excess of like 300 million people. Yeah, that's going to be easy. We need to pray for them. We need to pray that God would give them wisdom and guidance. We need to, to pray that they will make decisions that will help us to be a righteous nation. A nation in which God could bless. To refuse to pray for them, regardless of whether or not we vote for them, is like desiring for a nation to go in the wrong direction. Like, whichever way this ship goes, you realize everybody on the ship is going, right? So we pray for them. The third thing is, listen to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. He says, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away, captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. So the third thing that we are to render to Caesar is we are to pray for the peace and prosperity of the nation. Now what I wanted you to hear in that is God say, I have sent you there. God sent Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, as captives to Babylon. Now, how many of you in here like to be told what to do? None of us, right? You can't.
can't tell me what to do. I'm a man. But working against a nation, not praying for peace and prosperity, it is going, you know what? I want everything to go bad so that maybe in four years I can have my way. That would be like running out in the middle of uh, traffic and going, you know what, I want to get hit so I can take a couple days off from work. I mean, nobody would do that. But when we do not pray for the peace and prosperity of the nation that God has placed us in, that's essentially what we're saying. See, God placed Judah in Babylon for a purpose, just as he has placed you where you are. For a purpose. Rooting for a president, regardless of party, to fail does not honor God, and it has no business being in the life of somebody who calls on the name of Jesus Christ. None. We have to understand this. We need to pray that God honors and blesses our nation, sometimes in spite of our elected officials. Go back to Romans 13, 1 to 7. We see that we are also to render to Caesar the fact that we are to be engaged in the process. Now, sometimes we forget this point. But you and I enjoy a privilege in America that is foreign to anybody in Scripture. You go, well, what are you talking about? We get to not only be governed but we get to do the governing because we get to vote. No one in the Bible, democracy did not exist in the first century. You know, we, we're running around talking about our religious freedoms. There's nowhere in the New Testament that they had religious freedom. They were always being ruled by an oppressive government. You and I have the right and the responsibility not just to submit to the government, but to help form that government. To help form who is going to make these laws. We get to do it every two, four, and six years. So we need to prayerfully elect officials who are going to primarily focus on two principles. First principle is this, doing good for everyone. Now, we, we tend to vote on what we have determined as best for us and our family and those closest to us. Yet the Bible would encourage us to think not of just our tribe, but of those around us. How do we see that? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have to desire the good of the whole. Not the few. This is the biblical mandate. The second principle that we should look for in an elected official is this. Someone who seeks justice. Now understand. In our own pledge. Injustice for how many? Oh. Justice is a principle that is throughout scripture. God is a just God. He will not allow injustice to go on forever. Now, he is permitting it for a time. But there will be a moment in the future in which the just God will come and will set everything right. We need to be a part of this justice that is done for all. We need to vote for officials who will champion biblical justice, not human vengeance. Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 to 7 says, Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. For the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheds man's blood, 
By man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Why do we cry out for justice where injustice is? Because every person is created in the image of God and therefore has eternal value to God. If justice is denied for one, it is justice denied for all. So we look for someone who will do good and someone who will require justice. Here's the last thing that it means to render to Caesars. What is Caesars? It's right here in our text in Mark. We need to pay taxes. Now I know we don't like them, but they are biblical. We are to participate, pray, and provide. Why? Because that is what God has done for us. But what does it mean to render to God what is God's? Because he doesn't just start, stop there. So he says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But then he says, render to God what is God's. What, what does he mean? What rightfully belongs to God? The answer is our heart. Now, what does it mean, heart? When you read heart in Scripture, it is the center of our emotions, our will, and our intellect. Our heart is everything we are in life. Our life as kingdom citizens belongs to God. This is what it means for us to, to do here. I love what David Platt said in the book. He says, quote, Caesar may have his image on a coin, but God has his image on the life of every person because we are all made in God's image, Amen. end quote. Amen. No one in this world is worthy other than God of our loyalty. No leader, no politician, no political party is worthy of our trust, our allegiance, or our hope. Why? Because they, like us, are fallen sinners. Every candidate... Every political party has weaknesses. They have idols. Only Jesus is pure, holy, and just. Only Jesus can give the remedy of what ails not only our nation, but our world. Only Jesus can change hearts. Only Jesus can provide, protect, save, and satisfy us. This is why our hope, our trust, and our allegiance belong to Jesus and Jesus alone. Romans 5 verses 6 through 8 tells us that only Jesus gave his life that we could be forgiven, saved, and have eternal life with him. This is something that no politician, no political party will ever be able to give to us. And this is why he and he alone is worthy of our heart. Now, we might be tempted to think that political turmoil is something new. <laughs> it's not. It's as old as the nation of Israel. I'm going to walk you through a story uh, somewhat quickly. It comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 8. The nation of Israel has just come through a time in which judges ruled them. And every judge, like politicians, they had some good qualities and they had some bad qualities. But towards the very end, the judges and the religious leaders, it was all corrupt. And so the people revolted. They said, we want a king. Now, there was a prophet that day. His name was Samuel. When the people said, we want a king, Samuel got mad. But God said, listen, give them the king. For Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But Samuel, before you give them a king, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to my people and I want you to tell them what a king is going to be like and what he's going to do to them. And so God told Israel they would regret wanting a king over them. Basically, God said they are going to use you and abuse you because they don't love you. Here's the amazing request, uh, the response that they give. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 19. They still say, we want a king. They're going to use you and abuse you, but you still want it. Yep. So the first king of Israel is a man by the name of Saul. You know, Saul kind of started off okay, but then in his pride, he disobeyed the word of God. He hurt the nation of Israel. He defamed the glory of God. 
despite numerous attempts at killing his successor to hold on to power, guess what? He still lost power. So then it led to the second king of Israel, a man by the name of David. In the book of, da in the book of Acts, David is called a man after God's own heart. David is clearly Israel's best king from an earthly standpoint, but David wasn't perfect. See, David committed adultery. To cover it up, he had the woman's husband killed. Then in his pride, David took a census of the people after God said, don't you do it. And as a result, 70,000 Israelites died because of David's pridefulness. Can I just ask a question real quick? Does this sound like the politicians we have? So here's the lesson for us, church. Evil leaders will let you down. And good leaders will fail you. This is why we remember the words of Psalm 146, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Or Psalm 20, and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You see, when we put and tie our hope, our trust, and our allegiance to a politician or a political party, we are rejecting Jesus as king, just like Israel. We're saying we know better than you what we need. We, like Israel in the Old Testament, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, when they were before Pilate, Pilate says, here's your king. What was their response? We have no king but Caesar. And i got to be really honest. Sometimes uh, on social media, I see an awful lot of Christians saying we have no God but some politician or some athlete or entertainer or whatever. When we do this, not only are we rejecting a loving God, but what we are saying is that we want the very people who have enslaved us to rule over us. Walk, walk down this party, uh, this uh, path with me really quickly, okay? Who instituted abortions, God or government? Same-sex civil unions, racist policies, a welfare state that makes it better or easier for you to stay at home than to actually go out and get to work. Excessive taxes that make it necessary for both parents to work outside of the home so that they can try to make ends meet, causing them to spend less and less time with their children. An education system that has removed God from its teaching. Answer me, who instituted those policies? The government. Then why in the world would Christians pledge loyalty to that? We don't know. I mean, they brought so much pain and suffering. And yet too often we tie our welfare to them. So what should we do as kingdom citizens? How do we participate in the governing process? And how are we going to act on Wednesday or whenever this election is decided? Well, here's the first one I want us to remember. Remember that God is sovereign. Yeah, I've seen it in, in multiple places. But the statement is this. If X, whichever person, if they win, then America's doomed. Now, I'm going to be honest. I've heard it both ways. I've heard it said that if the president wins re-election, America's doomed. I've heard it said that former Vice President Biden wins. America is doomed. Hear me clearly on this. That is absolutely unbiblical. Politicians and political pro parties do not protect, prosper, and preserve a nation. The sovereign God does. Amen. If our hope is in a politician or political party, we're already doomed. You know why? Because that means the sovereign God is no longer on his throne. And we got bigger problems than we even real realize at this point. But because the Bible teaches that God has been, is, and forever will be on the throne, we as kingdom citizens have zero reason to fear. 
Zero. For whatever happens on Tuesday, whatever happens beyond Tuesday has been ordained by God and it is Him working out His eternal plan for His glory and His children's good. Here's something else that we see around election time and you really see it on social media more. Jesus for president in 2020 or whatever year the election happens to be. This is also a very unbiblical statement and has no right coming from our mouth or being posted on our social media walls. Why? Because for Jesus to become president would mean that he would have to step off the throne as king and demote himself to president. Jesus never has, never will step off his throne. Jesus is never on the ballot. As long as we look to Jesus, no matter what happens in this election or elections beyond this, we can still live the abundant life that God has promised us in John chapter 10. Now listen, I understand. We're afraid that if certain candidates win, that we're going to lose certain religious freedoms. Can I ask you something? And this is going to get really personal. Why are we so afraid of persecution when Jesus says, if you love me and live for me, you will experience it? Persecution is how God purifies his church. Now, I'm not running out going, hey, I want everything to go wrong. I want persecution to come. But we have no reason to fear because whatever comes into our life or this nation, God has already ordained it, knew it was coming, and has a plan to bring us through. God is sovereign. We've got to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Which means we need to do this. Second point of application. Answer the most important question. You know, we've been talking about a lot this morning, but there's one question I've got to ask before I go any further. Does Jesus have your heart? Because the truth is, no matter what happens on Tuesday, if Jesus doesn't have your heart, you're not talking temporary problems, you're talking eternal condemnation. This is why it's so important. If Jesus doesn't have your heart, then you are helpless and you are hopeless. Not just now, but for all of eternity. Listen, I'm going to be honest. America is at a crossroads. Not because of politicians, political parties, or an upcoming election. We are at a dangerous crossroad because America has largely and very loudly said we don't want God. We have turned our backs on him. And then we go and sing, God bless America. Why? Now I'm going to get even more personal. I don't blame the lost for doing that. Why do we get shocked when the lost act like they're lost? The reason that God's hand of blessing would be taken off of the nation is not because the lost are acting like the saved, that they're lost, but that the saved are living like the lost. It's why Peter says that judgment must begin in the house of God. We do not look to a donkey or an elephant as our hope. We look to the Lamb of God. We participate in the governing process, but no matter what happens, they cannot silence the church from going out and telling people about Jesus. We are at a crossroads, and the church is remaining largely silent. We can't. And we can't just be vocal on Tuesday. We have to be vocal every single day. We have to hold our elected officials, whoever they are, to the fire. And guess what? If they don't do what they're supposed to do, vote them out. It's the only way. I want to ask you right now, does Jesus have your heart? Has there come a moment in which you recognize that you are a fallen sinner deserving of God's judgment? But then in his love, he showed you his grace. And 
you surrender not just part of you, but all of you to him. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Truthfully, we may not even make it to Tuesday. We may not be able to step into a holy place. God may go, yep, my plan stops on Monday. Do you have that peace that passes all understanding that you have peace with God? That whether we make it another 50 plus years or we're out of here in 50 minutes, we will stand before, not Caesar, but God, and we will fall at his feet worshiping for all of eternity. That's what this moment is about. This moment is bigger than an election. This is about your eternity. Do you know? If not, we want to provide that opportunity to tell you how. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, this is what I want you to do. If you need to know more about who Jesus is, email me at Pastor Justin at WestlakeBaptist.org. I would love to spend the rest of my day replying to emails, making phone calls, of telling people not what's going to happen on Tuesday, but how they can be prepared for eternity. If you're here, we're going to give you an opportunity in a few moments to respond. But if you're watching this on the live stream, we want to encourage you. Reach out to us. We want to tell you about Jesus. To my brothers and my sisters here this morning, we've got a very important role to play, not just on Tuesday, but today, Monday, and every other day that God leaves us here. We have to be salt and light. We cannot back down. We cannot be silent. We must vote according to God's values. But there's a bigger thing here. See, we need to resist human nature, the temptation to get down in the mud and roll around with the pigs. Because you know what happens when you get down and roll around in the mud with the pigs? You get muddy too. We have to keep our eyes up and focus on Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and this was the most messed up church possible in the New Testament. He spends 12 chapters correcting their problems. They had gossip. They had backbiting. They were slandering each other. They were suing each other. They were having inappropriate sexual relationships. They were divorcing one another and all sorts of other stuff. So Paul spends 12 chapters going, you guys are acting like a bunch of heathens. But then he flips at the very end. Very end of chapter 12, he says this, but now I show you a more excellent way. And the very next verse is chapter 13, verse 1, the love chapter. He said, the cause of all your problems is not time, talent, or treasures. The cause of your problems is you. You got a love problem. You know why you gossip about each other? Because you don't love God, you don't love others. You know why you're getting divorced? Because you don't love God. You don't love your spouse. You want to know why your family's falling apart? Because you don't love God. You don't love others. You want to know why you got division in the church? Because you don't love God. You don't love others. I showed you a more excellent way. Love. Church, we have got to share and to show the love of Jesus to one another and to those around us. Who's your one? Who is it that you are going before the throne of God, crying out day and night, knowing that they are lost and in need of Jesus? There's no greater way that you can show love for God and them than to pray for them and to share the gospel. Because regardless of what happens on Tuesday, people will still die. And they will either go to heaven or they will go to hell based solely on the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our message. That's how we live as kingdom citizens in a fallen world. Nothing less can be acceptable for God's children. Are you living as a kingdom citizen? There's a time to bend on our face before God. Would you stand with me as we're going to pray together?
Father, we thank you for this opportunity just to come before you, to spend time in worship, worship through music, worship through a message. And Father, regardless of political leanings, this text speaks because it forces us to ask a simple question. Who is on the throne of my heart? Who is the one that is in control of my life? If it's anyone other than Jesus, then we are in very real danger of not just losing an election, but losing our soul for all of eternity. So, Father, I pray for that person that may be in this room this morning or those who may be watching on the live stream. That if they do not know you as Lord and Savior, they have not surrendered themselves to you. Father, would you speak to them? Would you help them to respond even now? Lord, not waiting for another moment, not trying to say, oh, I got time to, to make a decision. But rather understanding the importance of this moment. This crossroads, not just for a nation, but for our very soul. Father, to my brothers and my sisters, Lord, I pray that we would all keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That we would be vocal about how someone can be saved and their need to be saved. Let us live as salt and light and amongst a dark, fallen world. Help us to respond to you in this moment and to live for you until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to stand and sing, this is going to be an opportunity for you to respond as we sing this final song. Again, the altar is going to be open. I'll pray with you. You can pray here. If you're watching the live stream, reach out to us. Jesus, I shall see when I look.